Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Young at Heart. My name is Maria Mera. I'm your host, and I'm also a financial advisor with Edward Jones, full disclosure. Um, I have with me, I'm humble and honored, and uh, someone that I admire, and uh, I follow her, and, uh, and I'm proud to call her my friend and my neighbor, and her name is Janet. Paulson Jerenico, and uh, she is the founder of the International Film Festival here in Hawaii. She's also been involved with nonprofit um, and profit organizations in the film industry. He's also a founder of the Palm Springs Festival, and, um, and now she has a podcast. Uh, we could spend the whole show talking about <laughs> her background, so let's just introduce her. Thank you very much, Janet, for joining me today. I'm so delighted to be here. Like you said, we're friends. And so just to see you makes me smile inside and outside. <laughs> yeah, I think we bring- Thank you for asking me. Each other. <laughs> Thank you so much. And did I, did I leave, uh, because you have such a great background that I, I tried to, did I leave something that you want to mention in the-, uh, in the I, I think it was just perfect. The only other thing <laughs> I'd add is that I, I've lived here now for almost 47 years in Hawaii, which is really hard to believe. But um, I grew up in Oregon um, and moved here in 1975. And I'm just, uh, so I'm almost so, going to be Kama Aina. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, I, oh, definitely. I'm curious of, um, first, what brought you to Hawaii? Was it just a move or if I want to go there? <sighs> Uh, well, it's kind of a long story, to tell you the truth, and it's kind of, um, it's, it's, it's complicated, but th the bottom line is my ex-husband and I really wanted to uh, start over and see if we could make our marriage work, and we just okay. thought, well, we'll just move away, and where should we go, well, why don't we go to Hawaii, and we landed on May 20th, 1975, and I'm still here, he's yeah. in Arizona. <laughs> It's a lot so, of time. We, just came, we didn't know anybody. Heard, we didn't I've have a job or anything. Before, I've heard the story before of the ex living in and the uh, and the woman staying. So <laughs> I can relate. Um, <laughs> so from before we get into um, yes, just because I want I want to go over your career, but I I also want to I want the audience to get you know you better and uh, and understand and make you justice of the impact that you have in this community and the impact that you have in diversity and the impact that you have with women and um, so from from your point of view when you arrive to Hawaii how is it for a mainlander to arrive here and were, were you welcome well that's a that's a wonderful question thank you so much um, I, I moved on May 20th, and uh, on May 23rd, which happened to be my birthday, we went to a bar, my ex-husband and I, called The Sty, where there was Hawaiian music, and it happened to be Eddie Kamai, who I'd never heard of in my life, and the sense of Hawaii playing music, and I just started to cry and cry, and it was of happiness and joy. I just felt the music spoke to me at a deep level that I had never really heard before. It was like his voice was uh, transmitting something very ancient and old that was connected to the Aina and land. And it was when I heard his voice that I knew that this is where I really wanted to be. And here I am all these years later, and I can still get tears in my eyes thinking of Eddie Kamai's music, you know? Yeah. And uh, uh, I didn't have that much, I had a little trouble. I mean, I think people have, would just be lying if I didn't say I had some problems, but um, I was very lucky in that I got hired fairly quickly uh, as at the educational television station as a production assistant, which was a fantastic job to get to start at the bottom of the film mm -hmm. industry. And I worked my way up to be a producer and writer after a few years. Um, and then I went to call. I did, hadn't had a degree. I went to the University of Hawaii while raising my three kids. And I just kind of got in through myself into this work, uh, into this community. And it's just been a, a big love affair, really. Uh, you so, know, with so, a few bumps along the way. That's that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like I, I, then this is something that I will always remember. Um, because and you told me this. Uh, keep falling forward. 
like every time oh, yeah, you yeah. Pull, pull yeah. forward. Yeah, that's <laughs> so, right. Uh, but what happened? I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell that story because I brought up my ex-husband. So when I uh went to see my divorce lawyer, he certainly gave me a lot of good legal advice, but he gave me some of the best advice I'd had in my life. And that was he says, I'm gonna tell you two words to do. Keep moving. And I thought, wow, because sometimes you just get up and you couldn't move, you were just paralyzed, you know, just feeling terrible. But I hear him saying to me, keep moving and get out of bed and get out and keep moving so that's what you're referring to and that really has been something that has guided me since 1980 yeah yeah usually lawyers are not the best to give uh, <laughs> personal <laughs> advice but in this in this case definitely i mean sometimes that's the best we can do right and just keep yeah. moving yeah okay well talking about dreams and talking about uh professional and and drive you were the founder of the film festival in hawaii mm -hmm. how do you get to how do you get to even dream of that so tell us the the years before uh how how do you get there well first of all i have to be real um clear that uh hawaii is a collaborative place you know we work as a team and we work real collaboratively and so even though i claim the title of the founder of the film <laughs> festival uh and was given that by the board of directors which i'm very grateful for and i was the first director from 1981 to 1996 it we, it couldn't have gotten done without a real amazing team 300 volunteers the first year if you can believe it i mean 300 people just gave so much of their time but anyway i was hired at the east west center after i got my degree i didn't have a degree when i moved here but i went back to school and got it and uh, after i got it i was hired in the public relations department and the first president of the that i that hired me of the east west center called me in and said think of three ideas where we can get hawaii closer to the to the community and one of my three ideas was a film festival. And he liked that idea. And he said, you go do it, but I'm giving you no money, but I'm giving you a Watts line, which was a phone you could call anywhere in the world. And I was thrilled to have an office, a Watts line and a job and an assignment. And so I started doing the film festival, even though I'd never been to one, never been to Asia. <laughs> and, uh, but with the help of some incredible people, I have to mention Tom Jackson, Hank Wong, Linda Little, these are just um, Victor Kobayashi uh, and uh, Frank Tillman. I just have to mention their names at the very beginning that first year. And uh, against all odds, and I do mean against all odds because that president got fired <laughs> and a new president came in and he didn't like what I was doing and told me to stop it. And I said, too late, we've handed out the tickets, they're coming. And he says, well, keep it small. And uh, I got a call from one of the TV stations at 7.30 in the morning when we were giving out free tickets. And he says, can you come down right away to the Varsity Theater? Because there's lines around the block, people waiting to get their free tickets. And so and we saw three tickets. So we, don't, we saw a picture of that varsity theater. Yeah. That there it that is. Part. There it is. <laughs> yeah. We we ran out of tickets in three days. Uh, and we have five, the, the capacity crowd, every seat taken, 5,000 people that first day. And uh, we had as our theme, When Strangers Meet. And I think I've given a logo there, our first year's logo. People really related to that because it was the emphasis was on cross-cultural relationships uh, for Asia Pacific and the United States. And we had after film discussions in hotels at the Hyatt Regency and in the theaters and the community just embraced it. So that the guy that wanted to fire me couldn't because the community <laughs> was too crazy over it. And we had a fundraiser and I think I've got a picture of the first fundraiser where Jack Lord who wrote us a check for $5,000, Olivia Newton-John uh, 
Alan Carr, who did Greece, who's pushing me out of the way. That's me with a hakule. So we can have room for to meet these celebrities. <laughs> uh, but we raised enough money at that first fundraiser at Sea Life Park to have the second festival. So it was all um, the community supporting it and helping. So how, how, much, how much for a financial advisor? <laughs> how much uh, did you have to raise? remember well the first year the first year um maybe i raised so much of it was in kind we were given theaters we were given the movies we were given hotel rooms we were given parties so it might have raised you know 75 oh we got a grant we got a grant from the hawaii committee for humanities for thirty-six thousand dollars, and that was about half our cash budget yeah um, now, you have to remember, my salary was paid for by the East West Center, and a lot of the people working on it were from but the East We West also talked about 40 years ago, right? For, for people yeah, but, but as yeah. we went along in years, by the time I left the festival, 15 years later, our budget was about a about million dollars. Uh, and so every year we had a raise, one million dollars, and we did, <laughs> thanks to the community. Oh. Um, has it been that festival has been going on every single year since you since you um, started? Yes, in nineteen eighty one, right? Yes, that's right. I think it's in its forty second year uh, now, and we've had great directors that followed me. You know, uh, and uh, but most of all, we've had this community of uh, the public uh, with the government but with the private enterprise, hotels and movie theaters and uh, volunteers. The volunteers have just been incredible. And then people just really supported. I think I have a picture of uh, Roger Ebert, the great film critic. I just called him up and Gene Sisko and said, do you want to come to Hawaii in November? Never met him in my life. Use that Watts line. And he was there. Now this picture you're looking at right now, I think it's extraordinary because the East West Center sent John Charlot, who was a scholar there to Vietnam. And this was right after um, we had, this was, he went to Hanoi. And this was when we just, the war had just ended and no one was, the Viet, North Vietnamese were not allowed at that point in America. They must not realized that Hawaii was part of America because they sent, we got this wonderful um, film delegation that showed uh, incredible films from Vietnam about the war that we fought and uh, from the Vietnam, from the North Vietnam side. And right in the next theater, we showed a, a film from the American point of view and then had a discussion afterwards with those filmmakers. And Roger wrote about it, and that really put us on the map. That was an amazing, amazing story. Yeah. 19, yeah. 1987. So um, one thing that I'm that as you're talking, and I'm I was looking at the pictures uh, before we started the program, um, and knowing you, right? One thing that it really um, strikes me is that it seems like a very competitive environment. But at the same time, just that teamwork and that everybody is willing to pitch in and come and, and do their best. Um, can, can, you, can you talk about that? Well, you know, there's two things here. We're talking about the festival and then we're talking about filmmaking. <laughs> or are you talking about yeah. fundraising? I don't it's know. The, the festival in this case. The festival oh. now? The festival now. Oh, when you, when, when you I started, it. when I started the festival, there were there was no other film festival in in Hawaii, and very few in America. In fact, very few in the world. I think I was one of the only, probably the only woman film festival director, uh, and uh, so my experience with the Hawaii International Film Festival. The first 15 years was more cooperation than competitive. Uh, and also we were free, free to get in. And also there weren't, there weren't that many films from Asia and the Pacific to show. So 
so uh, it was built on a very collaborative point of view and not so competitive, except maybe to get in later on, particularly when there became more films. Now the film industry might be a whole other story and it's actually something I'm trying to work on now. And we could talk about it now or I can talk about it later. I'm trying to change that. <laughs> let's, make it let's, more collaborative. let's take a little break here, Janet, uh, and then we will reconvene and continue with our uh, evolution of the film industry in Hawaii. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll, we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. I feature a wide range of amazing guests who share valuable insights about how going beyond the lines leads to success in everything you do in life. I'm looking forward to you joining me every Monday at 11 a.m. Aloha. And welcome back, everybody. We are um, in our So Young at Heart, and we have Janet Olson and Nico, and we just left it in an interesting point talking about competitiveness, and, uh, and, and what about um, those local artists and filmmakers, Janet? How, how did you work with them directly, or um, how, how, is yeah. that, how does that work, that team work? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, which I strive to do. At the, at the very beginning, that, that was one of the problems we had with the East West Center and why we broke away, because they did not, the head people, the top people, did not want local filmmakers. They wanted more Asia and Pacific ones. Uh, uh -huh. And we're not, I wanted, and a lot of the people working on it really wanted the local filmmakers. So what we did is, um, yeah, in 1987, was there weren't that many local filmmakers, but we were really on the lookout for them. And about 1985, 87, here came Eddie Kamai, the, the very singer who I had heard in, um, in Stye that I told you about earlier. And he and his wife uh, worked together, and they just made the most incredible new films. And uh, so... The only time he ever wore a tuxedo in his life was to accept the best documentary award at the Hawaii <laughs> Film Festival. And he and there was another wonderful Hawaiian, native Hawaiian filmmaker named Pui Pao. And he and his partner, Joan Lander, just made incredible films on the history of Hawaii from the, and the, the politics of Hawaii, where Eddie was more on the people of Hawaii. He got right into the politics and presented a new way to look at the history of Hawaii, the act of war, the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom. We took that to the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., as well as the Hawaii Film Festival. We took Eddie with the Sons of Hawaii to the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., to New York at the Film Forum. So we did much more than just show here, but we took the whole local filmmakers on tour, uh, including, and always try to include music and always trying to include food because those are big elements of our Hawaii culture. And uh, this is the greatest memories that we did. But I think it's important to know that we were really the leaders with Asia Pacific and Hawaii filmmakers in introducing them all over the country. We went from university to university, got funding for it. So that it was a full-time year-round job, not just in Hawaii, but we were on fire with this show. Doing the, the, the public relations, right, of the, of, of the film festival and, and, and everything, Asian and Pacific film industry. 
Yeah, you know, yeah, we we really wanted to promote the Hawaii point of view, the Hawaii storytelling that looks at things that had not had a chance to tell stories because let's face it, most of history is written by the by the um, the people who win the win the battles, win everything. Not the uh, the the people don't often get to tell the stories. So we believed in stories from the bottom up. And the why yeah. you know, they're untold stories that was just like mining gold, and our yeah. Hawaii filmmakers are telling those stories visually, uh, and the, the Hawaii Film Festival is on fire not just then but now, with yeah. um, with telling these stories and, and highlighting. And yes, uh, and yes, listening to you, I think that is not only the film, the Hawaii Film Festival that is on fire. Yes, you, you're very passionate about it, and that's what you need to to bring something to to a, to a whole new, different level. Um, so, question now, 2021, what is the future of the film festival? Well, you know, I'm not on the board, and I'm not the Hawaii. Uh, film festival director, so I don't speak officially, but I'm absolutely delighted. And I think we have a picture of all the four film festival directors who've been directors since the beginning of the time. I'm just so thrilled. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck Bowler, uh, who started working for me, and then he was hired uh, as the film festival director. And the woman with the lay there in the center is uh, Becky. Stroacci, I hope I'm saying her last name right, it's Italian. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, but anyway, she is incredibly great uh, director now and really helping with the Hawaii filmmakers. So it's strong. She's taken the festival out of debt and, and got money in the bank to help with this next year's festival. And she has gotten her staff to really be flexible with the pandemic and show films virtually and I just am so proud of her. And then the, the last director before her was Robert Lambeth. So yes, it's continuing. It was flexible to, um, to change because you know people didn't really want to go to a big theater during the pandemic. And uh, so we used Zoom and just streaming films and you'd have those same after film discussions and workshops and you could, on your screen was the film from the, uh, the Philippines or from New York or from from Seoul and they, they didn't have to pay to be here we could just see them on our screen and and talk to them real time so uh it worked it worked yeah with this new way so I think okay. it's gonna go tell us a little bit. sorry I'm interrupting you uh but I, I want I want you to tell us everything so what, what are the new projects I had I had something um in the works with the Spalding House, what used to be the Contemporary Art Museum, right? Um, tell us yeah. about that. Well, okay. First of all, I think I'm going to talk about the vision behind the Spalding House, because the Spalding House is where we want the vision to be actualized, because it's a perfect place. The vision is that just what we, it was your wonderful question, Maria. You asked it about the competitiveness versus a cooperative way of being. And filmmaking has gotten kind of competitive. But anyway, the film festival, there's about 10 um, nonprofit film organizations in Honolulu. 10. And instead of them always um, kind of separate and raising their money and doing their programs, we want to bring them together. Now, they all kind of need homes because um, uh, most of them are just going from the good heart of landlords yes. uh, or month to month or taking cheap places. Yes. What about having everybody come together at the Spalding House? Yes. What about having all the film organization have a headquarters, one place where they can talk, you know, be collaborative, where they can be creative together and create new programs that benefit the whole of Hawaii, particularly our underrepresented voices particularly the filmmakers who have stories that we have not heard. Why can we not incubate their stories and turn them into films in the beautiful Spalding House area? It has gardens and, and a cafe 
And, and we have uh, a, sorry, while, while you talk, I would love, uh, Eric, if we, you can play the video while um, Janet is talking so people can have the picture in their, in their heads. Um, but otherwise, yes, uh, Hiteli and Janet will, will try yeah. to find that. Yeah, it'd be great to see it so you can get a feeling of that. See how gorgeous it is? What about uh, dreaming and telling stories and talking as you're walking down there? Uh, Spalding House is historic. Um, it has a deep roots in this community, a uh, cultural meaning to people, and it's up for sale. And rather than a private person buy it, wouldn't it be great if this community bought it and there's tax deductions for people who might uh, want to buy it that they can get um, and have this be the home and hub and gathering place of film organizations and film film makers. It has three apartments that we can bring in great filmmakers from around the world to work with our filmmakers and we could be free to look to Asia and the Pacific as equal as we look to the continent in finding our own cinematic style. So that's the dream of the future I have. And there's a whole group of us working on making it true. And if any of your listeners have the money to buy it or more interested in, in more information, they can let you know and then you'll tell me. <laughs> It could not be a more beautiful place, um, definitely. So, yeah, um, um, I would love to see that that vision that you have made into reality. Um, Janet, I'm going to go ahead now, and I would like uh, I would like to just fire you a couple of quick questions, and uh, if you can give me a quick answers or, or however you want to respond. Um, what qualities do you look for in a person? What can you repeat the question? What, what what do you what do you like from a person? What qualities uh, do you want someone who is you who mean has what a, qualities or, look for in a festival? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. Just in a person. These are just more personal person. questions to you. Person. Okay. Well, I like someone who's really yes, deep, 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 deep there. <laughs> fully alive, like you, Maria. Fully alive <laughs> and. and fully Fully uh, true and authentic to yourself, not you know, not uh, not trying to pretend you're something that you're not. You know, I, I like people who are transparent, who are um, who are interested in other people, who are empathetic. I'm um, I'm usually drawn to people who are from different cultures. I guess it's because I'm married to Polynesian, and I've been Im immersed in. Um, in uh, cross-cultural relations and films now for 40 years. <laughs> you could not be more cross-cultural at every level. Uh, who is who is a hero of yours in life or a role model? Who's my role model? Gosh, these are such good questions. Uh, well, this is really funny, but I think of women, you know, I mean, I'm really strong on um, what women influence me and you have to remember that I grew up at a time when uh, you just had to manipulate men and figure out how to work them because you weren't supposed to be around and in positions of power. And so you batted your eyelashes and, and uh, got things done, but it was in a manipulative way. So, yeah. uh, and so I think the biggest change I've seen in my lifetime is, is the women how far women have come. But the two women who influenced me the most was probably Tina Turner. Ah, I oh, love that. Turner. I love, the, I love her, her zest for life. I love her get up and fight. I love her not being discouraged with things, not letting anyone or anything let her go. And uh, probably a person just the opposite of that would be another role model of mine, and that's Mary Bitterman who was working at the East-West Center and was the first woman that was a head of public television, the first woman who was a head of the cultural and communication at the East-West Center. And she did it in, um, she was educated, she had her PhD, she knew how to administrate, she knew how to be collaborative, she knew how to listen, uh, quite a bit different from Tina Turner. But, uh, <laughs> 
He made things happen by knowing, uh, by being so wise and smart and, and good values, good heart. And they would, they would love to hear those words coming from you. You know, they're a strong, independent woman, uh, more, more power to you. Um, give us uh, your favorite movie or the favorite film that you can think of. Uh, well, my favorite movie is usually the movie I'd seen last that I really liked. And this is no exception when you've asked me right now. So the movie that comes immediately to my mind is, of all things, the Bangladesh movie. There's a beautiful Bangladesh movie it's going to show at the film festival this year. I urge people to see it. It's called um, Salt in Our Water. And it's made by an indigenous Bangladesh director. It's his first feature. And it is just incredible about an artist who goes to a fishing village and encounters a fisherman as he brings his art of being a, a sculpture and the clash of, of culture. And how do they come together with it as climate change comes to happen to this village? Um, I just thought the way he made this film with the people who lived in this little fishing village was such an amazing treat to see. That's kind of the, gives you the kind of films I like, but That's, yeah. So we're gonna have to dig in up. Salt in our waters? It's called uh, The Salt in Our Waters. Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll write that one out. Um, your favorite place on earth? Oh, um, probably two places, Makapu'u, like, up at the lighthouse looking over, or just the hike up to Makapu'u. I love that. And Waimanalo Bellows. That's probably my favorite. But a very close second is southern France. Oh, yes. <laughs> or north of Spain. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just adding that. I'm just adding that out there. Um, Janet, just to finish up, tell us how would you like to be remembered? Oh my God, these questions are amazing. How would I like to be remembered? Okay, I can answer that as a storyteller. You know, I am a storyteller. I started uh, my career as a professional storyteller with the Artist in the Schools program in Oregon, which is also my favorite place in the world, Oregon and uh, Hawaii. Uh, for, and then uh, from stories, uh, I, that's how I got into film, really. I would still be a storyteller. I still am a storyteller with my podcast. But um, there's so many great storytellers here in Hawaii that I thought I should just be helping their stories be told rather than going in the schools and tell them myself. Um, and also, you know, I'm a mother. And um, I'm a grandmother. I'm a great grandmother. And I've got this great husband. So um, I want to be known, I guess, as a woman who is a storyteller and um, feeling very fulfilled about my life at this stage. This is so beautiful, Janet. I, um, I love your passion and I love your energy. And uh, for those who don't know your, your podcast, it's called wildwisdomthepodcast.com. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. And I love so, <laughs> I, I, I invite you. Uh, I would invite our audience, you as our audience, to uh, listen to this podcast and follow these very, very um, interesting um, women. And uh, thank you so much, Janet. I, I really appreciate you coming here today. It's been my great pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, keeping us all young at heart. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everybody. We'll see you next Tuesday on Young at Heart and uh, Aloha.